Good evening, everybody. Amen. Great to see you tonight. Wonderful that you're here. My name is Marty. I'm a minister here at Raven Hill. I would just like to welcome each and every one of you here tonight, especially those of you who are friends and family of our five new elders. This is a, such an exciting night in Raven Hill, and we're so thrilled that God is bringing new elders into our church this evening. Just a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is that you should have got a little envelope and a little brochure on your seat as you came in. This is information about the Students' Bursary Fund in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And this is a fund that supports ministers in training and deaconesses in training as well. And it really helped me whenever I was going through my training as a minister. So if you so felt led tonight, um, why not give a little donation to that and you can put it in the buckets on the way out. But do please consider giving to the Students' uh, students Bursary Fund. Also, after our service tonight, and there's going to be tea and coffee and some biscuits, and so I'd encourage you to stick around for those. If you remain seated where you are, they will come to you. So just stay where you are and enjoy a cup of tea and coffee and some fellowship together. But tonight we're here not just to ordain new elders, not just to enjoy being together, but tonight we're here to worship God. So let's stand together and give him our praises as we sing 10,000 reasons.
So we'll come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we enter indeed into your gates with thanksgiving and with praise. We thank you that there are many voices singing praise tonight here, but can we imagine 10,000 voices singing? Can we imagine 10,000, thousand voices singing? Well, that's what heaven's like. That's like what it is where you are. And so we praise you, we worship you, we bless you. So Lord of glory tonight as we praise you. We come here tonight in the hush of winter. But we know as we come here in February that spring is just around the corner. And we know that because your promises do not fail. You always deliver. You have said seed time and harvest will always prevail. And in order to have a seed time, we need spring. Spring comes after winter. Thank you for your fulfilling of your promises. We do praise you for the abundance that you give us in your created world. Your generosity is, is incredible. And in it itself, we have a foretaste of heaven. We receive gift after gift. We experience these through our sensual experiences. And we thank you for them. We enjoy the wonderful taste of a lovely meal, the sight of a sunset, the chirping, we hear the chirping of the birds and the roaring of the tide, the tenderness of a child's embrace, the smell of a garden, the height of its glory. In all of this, you sent and you give, and we thank you. We live in a country that is so beautiful. Sleep donnered, rolling down to the sea. Its weightless, its weight is incomparable to your weightless glory, your majesty. The Atlantic is minute compared to your immensity. Your picturesque countryside peels into insignificance in the light of your glory. The shooting stars are feeble compared to your power. The ferocious lion is tame compared to your wildness. Who is this that we worship? Lord, we cannot measure you. We cannot put you in a box. You are incredible. And so we come and worship and in awe to you tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. And Lord, we thank you that you are ever present with your people. And so come to us this evening in this service of worship. We are aware that we have even sinned today, this your day, in word, thought, and deed. And the sins that we have committed are like the sprinkling of ink. We have blotted our copybook. They've been sins of omission, and sins of commission. Where sometimes we feel like the liver, we're unclean. And even our very best of deeds are like filthy rags. So come to us, our Father, lest we feel like an autumn leaf on a tree that is carried away with the wind and it is gone. Do not hide your face from us, O God. Do not let our sin, our sin sweep over us and wash us away like a flood. But we come to you here as a Father, a Father who cares for his children, Yes, we are clay, but you are the potter. And may you work within our own lives so that we are shaped into the vessel that you would want us to be. Through that, Lord, we know that it's in Christ we find forgiveness for that blotted copybook. It's through repentance that we come afresh to you. So wash us, cleanse us, forgive us again. Renew us through your gospel of grace and bring us back to the foot of the cross. Father, as we meet tonight, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit in ministry in this church. We thank you for the minister, Mark Tree, for his team all around him, for his current elders and the new elders elect. We ask that you will do a great work here, as you have already been doing, bringing people bringing people to faith, discipling them and training them for service. 
give them every resource to carry out their ministry so it is overflowing with joy and praise and service. So pour out your spirit tonight as we worship, as we praise. May Jesus Christ be exalted in all that we do. We ask this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. <coughs> One of the things we do as a presbytery at an ordination service like this is we read a statement on the eldership. And one of the members of the commission, and we have various members of commission here tonight, there's myself, moderator, and then there's Reverend Stephen Burr, Clark, uh, Deputy Clark, who's not here, uh, Martin Hampton, who can't be here tonight, the convener, Dr. Reverend Dr. Frank Seller, and then commission members Reverend Gary Ball from Orangefield, Paul McRoberts from Gildenberg, and Kirk Shillady from Bloomfield. And I'm going to ask Kirk to come and read the statement of eldership. Thank you, Kirk. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. Two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. 
and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and threshing shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atonable. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Thank you, Colin. So we'll stand and praise God again in our second item of praise, King Forevermore.
to the more formal bit in the next few minutes as we will um, ordain the five new elders elect. Just to say it's good to be back with you here in Ravenhill. I don't know how long Murray's installed. Is it 40 years or 35? <laughs> Seems a long time ago, Murray, but um, it's good to be back with you here as looking after Ravenhill here was a pleasure and delight. And you got a good man to be the minister. Let us just come to God in prayer to constitute the presbytery. Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. You're the God Almighty. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to constitute us as a presbytery here at East Belfast, the court of your church. And to make us able to fulfill the purpose for which we have met through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with the Father and the Holy Spirit we be honour, glory, dominion, now and always. Amen. It's in the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sole King and Head of the Church, who gives gifts for the edifying of the Church, the body of Christ, that we are met here as a commission of presbytery for the ordination and installation of Andrew Eves, Stephen Gilliland, Joshua McCracken, Scott Monteith, and Peter Scott. The clerk, as required by the law of the church, when I read the statement of the standards of the church, including the rule of faith, as set forth in the book of the Constitution and Government of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, Robert Stephen Gilliland. set forth in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments is the only infallible rule of faith and practice and the supreme standard of the church. It is the privilege, right and duty of every person to examine the scriptures and each individual is bound to submit to their authority. Having formed a definite conviction as to what the will of God is upon any subject, it is each person's duty to accept and obey it. In exercising this God-given right of private judgment, individual Christians are not to set their reason above the Word of God or to refuse light from any quarter. Guided by the Holy Spirit, they are to use their reason to ascertain the divine will as revealed in Scripture and are to refuse to subject conscience to any authority except that of the Word of God. In the words of the Westminster Confession, God alone is Lord of the conscience and has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are in anything contrary to his word or beside it in matters of faith or worship. The Presbyterian Church in Ireland as a witness for Christ has adopted subordinate standards. And these are found what the church understands the word of God to teach on certain important points of doctrine and worship. These subordinate standards are a testimony for truth and against error and serve as a bond of union for members of the church. The Confession of Faith, as approved by the Church of Scotland in her Act of 1647, and the larger and shorter catechisms prepared by the Westminster Assembly of Divines are the subordinate standards of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Accepting these subordinate standards, the Church holds that civil rulers must be obedient to Christ in their own area of authority, yet they ought not to attempt in any way to constrain any person's religious beliefs or intrude upon their rights of conscience. The Church alone has the right to interpret and explain her standards under the guidance of the Spirit of God.
Having heard the Declaration of Treasury and Statement on our Standards and the Rule of Faith, you are now required to answer the following questions. Firstly, on your personal sense of calling. Insofar as you know in your own heart, our zeal for the glory of God, love for the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and desire for the salvation of souls and the upbuilding of the Church, your chief motives in entering upon the office of ruling elder to which you have been called. Secondly, three questions on the rule of faith and standards of the church. Do you believe the word of God is set forth in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the only infallible rule of, of faith and practice? Do you accept the Westminster Confession of Faith as described in the statement from the code read by the clerk to be founded on and agreeable to the word of God? As such, do you acknowledge it as a confession of your faith? And do you accept the catechisms compiled by the Assembly of Divines at Westminster and received as the catechisms of this church? Are you resolved through God's grace firmly and constantly to adhere to the fundamental doctrines of the faith set forth in the said confession and catechisms so long as you remain an elder of this church? Finally, two questions on the discharge of your duties as a ruling elder in this church. Do you believe the Presbyterian form of church government to be founded on and agreeable to the Word of God? And do you promise to adhere to and to support it and to yield submission in the Lord to the courts of the church? Do you pledge yourself as a member of Kirk Session to work together with the minister in the oversight and government of this congregation for the upbuilding of God's people in spiritual fruitfulness and holy concord and for the extension of Christ's kingdom. You have confessed your belief that the word of God contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. It is under that supreme standard which alone is final that this church holds its subordinate standards. This being understood, are you now prepared to subscribe in terms of the General Assembly's formula? I believe the Westminster Confession of Faith is described in the Code, Chapter 1, Paragraphs 12 to 14, to be founded on and agreeable to the Word of God. And as such, I subscribe it as the confession of my faith. So each elder with your own pen, black, hopefully you've got, will come up and subscribe. Dennis has got the paper here um, to the formula and to the signature. So in alphabetical order, please. <laughs> I'm going to ask the congregation if you would please stand. We have a prayer of coordination and installation now for the new uh, elders elect. While I pray, the commission will go forward and lay on hands. So let us come before God and let us pray. 
Lord Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ belongs to you. You established it and you have been building it for generations now. In this generation of these days where we live and work and have our being are really challenging at this moment. In spite of these new challenges, we believe that you said that you will build your church. And even the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. So help us to keep going when times are challenging, when things are difficult. And we ask you now that you will come alongside these new elders. You will bolster the leadership here in Raven Hill. And so we thank you for each elder as we all stand before you. And we ask that you will grant us your Holy Spirit, the presbytery of East Belfast, and to you, your servants, whom we do now with prayer in the laying on of hands, ordain to the office of ruling eldership, and install to the oversight of this congregation Andrew Ease, Stephen Gilliland, Joshua McCracken, Scott Monteith, and Peter Scott. Guide each one here today, and with the wisdom available from you, from them to do their job well, give them grace and love as they share in ministry, as they represent you here, and also represent you in the wider church. Give them all the wisdom and all the help they need. In relation to the congregation here, as they connect with young and old, sick and, what, and as well, Lord, may you go before them, give them a spirit, Lord, of joy as they minister. Give them, Lord, a heart filled with your word, a mind filled with love and devotion, heart filled with love and devotion for you. Bless this congregation where they will serve. Bring early encouragements and multiply those encouragements as the days go on. May they see many coming to faith, many being discipled in the name of Jesus Christ. And so to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, may you receive all the glory and praise. May it go to you forever and ever. Amen. We sing their running blessing.
congratulate you, Andy and Stephen, Josh, Scott and Peter on your calling and ordination this evening to the eldership and to wish you and your families and the whole congregation of Raven Hill huge blessings in your life and witness together. In order to encourage our hearts for service, please turn with me then to the Old Testament passage which Colin read to us a little earlier. It's the account of a vision of God which the prophet Isaiah had while he was worshipping at church in the year 742 BC, an event which transformed his life forever. But first of all, let us pray. Incomprehensible, yet not unknowable God, we turn to you now and pray that in your mercy you might be gracious to us and grant us a glimpse of your glory. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Today, as you know, is the 70th anniversary of the accession to the throne of Queen Elizabeth II platinum jubilee. The UK has been fortunate to have been blessed by her reign and it will be a sad and momentous day when she dies. The death of a monarch is always a significant event in the life of any nation. And if that passing has been after a very long rule, as it was with King Uzziah, it was especially significant in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord seated on a throne. The king was dead. Long live the king. King Uzziah had died, but the Lord was seated upon his throne. And his throne, we are told, was high and exalted. And his train, the train of his robe, filled the temple. The robe's un, uh, seeming unending length is indicative of the one who is supreme in his omnipresence, immense in his omnipotence, unsurpassing in his glory. Above him were seraphs, angelic beings, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying, and they were calling out one to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of the seraphs' voices, verse 4, the doorposts and the thresholds of the building shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. A number of weeks ago, a young lad from a solid middle-class American family was convicted of multiple murders. The judge gave him opportunity to explain why he had done what he had done. And this is what he said. My parents taught me two things. To believe in God and that God doesn't really matter. If Isaiah's vision of the Lord seated upon the throne tells us anything, it is this that God is to be treated with the utmost seriousness and that God has the right to rule over our lives with absolute and complete authority. C.S. Lewis grasped that, having come late to faith in Christ. This is what he said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Parents, it's not enough that we teach our children that God merely exists. Even the devil knows that. Now our responsibility first is to take God seriously for ourselves. It's not sufficient that we teach our families about God. It is vitally important that we and our children and our congregations encounter God. Let me give you an illustration. 
Let's say that each week in church, Marty taught about the Holy Land. Every week the preacher highlighted the importance of Hebrew and Greek. He showed you maps. He pointed out the towns, the villages, the mountains of Israel and Palestine, Golan and Jordan. He described in detail the topography and archaeology of the land and waxed lyrical about good books from the Middle East, how he had greatly enjoyed and benefited from them. And then one day you decide, do you know something? I'm going to visit the Holy Land myself. You go online, buy a plane ticket to Tel Aviv, you land at Ben Gurion Airport and say the word Shalom and Hallelujah. You visit Cana of Galilee, Bethlehem of Judah, Caesarea Philippi, Nazareth, Jericho and Jerusalem. You swim in the Dead Sea and paddle in the River Jordan and you come home animated. What you once knew in theory now you have experienced in person. And that's what happened to Isaiah. Through this vision he had, he encountered God. And this revolutionized his perspective and transformed his life. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated upon a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. There are seven perfect things I would like you to notice about Isaiah's vision here in Isaiah chapter 6. Seven glimpses into the glory of God, which when experienced revolutionizes faith, service, and ministry. The first one is this, that God is alive. Uzziah was dead. God was alive. From everlasting to everlasting you are God. Think of all the prime ministers, presidents and potentates who with all their personal agendas exercise power on planet earth. In 50 years time all of them will be gone. The low earthly rulers rise and fall. The Lord who has never had a beginning will never cease to be. Glimpse number one of God's glory. He is alive. Two. God is authoritative. Note please where God is located. He is seated on his throne. In other words, God is supreme in his sovereignty, composed in his demeanor, and sovereign in his supremacy. God is not worried, anxious, or at his wit's end. He is seated on his throne. We don't give authority to God over our lives. He already has it. We can pretend, of course, that he doesn't rule, or else we can own it with joy. God is not to be questioned, criticized, nor railed against. We may weep with perplexity, but we may not rebel against his sovereignty. God is authoritative. There is no one above him. He is our final appeal. Three, God is all-powerful. The word for that is omnipotent. In his vision of God, Isaiah sees that the Lord is high and exalted. He is not one of many thrones, nor does he share his glory with any other. God is exalted. He is of unlimited power, high and lifted up. God is all-powerful. Four, the reign of his the train of his robe filled the temple. In other words, God is resplendent. The glory of God extends as far as his robe. I wonder if you've ever stopped to think about the lavishness of God in, in his creation, the complexity of shapes and colors and senses and designs which is made, the extravagance of the stars and the universes. Between 100 and 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And our galaxy, only one of 100 billion other galaxies. God is lavish in his exuberance, resplendent in his glory. His train fills the temple. Fifthly, God is revered. Above him, verse 2, were says, 
each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts of the temple and the threshold shook. As these heavenly beings hover over the divine throne, with their wings they cover their eyes, lest they look upon God and be overcome by his glory. They may be heavenly creatures, but they are also created beings, unworthy to glance at the sheer brightness of God's overarching glory. With two wings they cover their feet. Exposed feet before a king would be a sign of disrespect and defilement, so they cover their feet. And with two they fly, and whether we do or not, they worship the Lord, for God is to be revered. Sixthly, in his vision, it is abundantly clear to Isaiah that God is holy. No, not just holy. Three times holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Israel's God is the most godly above all gods holy. There is no one like him because he is beyond all comparison. Holiness starts with God, and holiness is defined by God. God is holy not because he keeps the rules, but because he makes the rules. No one is holy like the Lord. His three times holiness places him in a realm all by himself, and there is no land, no place, no sphere untouched by his purity, power, and absolute holiness. Seventhly, God is glorious. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Our God is a consuming fire, who hates iniquity and cannot bear look upon injustice. No wonder Isaiah cries out, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am a person of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The closer you are to the light, the more it reveals imperfection. From the soles of his feet to the tip of his head, Isaiah realizes in the presence of the living God just how rich and filthy and unclean and ruined he really is. And in the presence of the living God, he recognizes he is part of a faithless and sordid community. No wonder he cries out in despair, Woe is me, for I am lost. In the awesome, holy, majestic company of Almighty God, it's not just the Metropolitan Police Force or Boris who have unclean lips. It is you, it is me who are in deep, deep trouble. Because of our unclean lips, we are under the righteous and holy judgment of God. What is the biggest problem in our world today? Hold a box pop at Forest Side Shopping Centre. Well, I guess up there we may well hear replies such as climate change, the price of fuel, poverty, youth suicide, Kim Jong-un, Russia and Ukraine. These and many other difficulties are indeed major problems in today's world. And yes, Christian people can and should be stirred to prayer and action because of them. Yet all of these enormous challenges are nothing when compared to this. That humanity is in total and utter alienation from God. In the presence of Almighty God, humankind is undone, ruined. How then can Isaiah, or indeed any one of us, stand in the presence of the Holy One with lips that are unclean and live? We, we can't. Unless, unless that is God does for us what we can never do for ourselves. Remove our guilt, purify our lips, atone for our sin, so that even as the word woe is on the tip of his unclean tongue, one of the seraphim flies over with a burning coal from the altar. The coal was so hot that even the seraph, this fiery heavenly creature, cannot bear to touch it. 
He has to use tongues in order to pick it up. And with the live flame, he sears the prophet's mouth and declares, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Heat is powerful. A flame can become so hot it actually can purify an object like silver refined in a furnace. So the word of the Lord purifies seven times. Psalm 12, verse 6. God is a consuming fire. And here's the mystery that the Lord Jesus, the second glorious member of this holy, holy, holy God, on the cross was high and lifted up, not in order to condemn the world with his red hot wrath, but in order to make atonement for it by his precious blood. So that we who were deserving of nothing but being consumed by fire might instead be cleansed of all our guilty stains. As Isaiah goes on to say in chapter 53, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. On the cross an offering was made and atonement effected. Guilty people need purification in order to live in God's presence. And sinful human beings require atonement before becoming messengers of God's perfect and holy will to this lost and needy world in all its complexity and alienation. And so it is not in spite of God's holiness that Isaiah becomes the recipient of God's great love and commission. But rather it is because of it. And so in verse 8 we come to these astonishing words. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for me? No, I've quoted that wrong. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? In the light of all that we have done for you, asks the triune God, what will you do for us? I said, here am I. Send me. What Isaiah had just experienced for himself now compels himself to make himself available to the Lord for this world. Cleansed and forgiven and powered by the one true living Lord, Isaiah is now able to offer himself to the Lord. Send me. In view of your incredible holiness and greatness, might and power, I'll go. In view of the desperate need of this wretched and sinful, hell-bound world, here I am, send me. And so as we finish, where does that leave us this evening? As individuals? As elders? As a congregation, as a commission, as people together who have encountered the living Lord. Well, let me give you three straightforward scenarios, any one of which may well be for you. First, God may be calling you to offer yourselves for missionary service overseas or full-time ministry of word and sacrament. Why not? If God has been prompting you to full-time Christian service, why delay? The Lord first prompted me, at the tender age of three, to serve the Lord as a minister of the gospel. And he can prompt you at the age of 63. Two. God may be encouraging you, Andrew and Stephen, Joshua, Scott, and Peter, as you have presented yourselves for service in this place and in this time as leaders in God's church, that service in Christ's name is not sustained by self-effort, but by God's supernatural strength and empowering which he alone gives. Hold on to that, dear men. 
Thirdly, God may be reminding each one of us that as we go from this place of encounter into the regular spheres of life and service at home and work and our day-to-day -day living, however urgent in our task, however necessary our work, His presence and His purity is with us, empowering us, enabling us to be His effective prophets and servants in our day and generation. Above all else, let's stop playing with God. Start taking Him seriously. Stop merely teaching our children that yes, God exists, but it doesn't really matter. If God is God, then He is of infinite significance and incredible importance. Now, but some of you may say, all this talk of mission and ministry and outreach, is it not too difficult? Demanding. Perhaps. Were it not for one incredible thing. You see, this encounter which Isaiah had with the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6 was not the first time that God had asked this question. Anyone prepared to go for us? With the reply given, Yes, Lord, I will go. For long, long before, far before creation had ever come into being, the holy, holy, holy Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who enjoy complete union and communion one with the other, in their infinite wisdom and understanding, chose to make this world, including human beings, in full awareness and knowledge that rejection would surely come rescue would be surely required. Ascending would be needed. One would have to go, not forced, but called. Not coerced, but selflessly and willingly, making himself available, even though it would be costly. Costing everything. And then when the question was asked, anyone prepared to go? As it were, the second person of the Holy Trinity stepped forward and said, Here I am. Send me. At precisely the right moment and exactly the right time, a Savior was born in Bethlehem. Thirty-three years later, high and lifted up on the cross at Calvary, the Lord Jesus was stripped of his robe. We beheld his glory. Is then all we have heard this evening far too demanding, too difficult, too daunting? Having had a fresh glimpse of God's glory, prepared to say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. So, Lord, that is our prayer. Whatever the cost, the implications. As you call, please also will you equip and enable us to say with every ounce of our being, Here I am, Lord, wholly available. As for me, I will serve the Lord. What we pray is in Jesus' abundant and most glorious name. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you in prayer. We acknowledge that we come before the one who is indeed high and exalted, the one who is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You sit enthroned in heaven. 
and yet you have come down to be with us, your children, here this evening. Moving amongst us by the power of your Spirit. Speaking to us from your living word. And inhabiting the praises of your people. So Father, it is in light of your glory, your greatness and your goodness that we bring our prayers of intercession before your throne of grace this evening. We thank you for our brothers who you have called and ordained to serve you as elders in your church here in this congregation of Raven. We pray for your special anointing on Andrew, Stephen, Joshua, Scott and Peter. Father, may they be aware of the love and support of your people and of your presence and grace ever with them as they seek to love and serve you and your church in and from this place. Father, would you continue to bless this congregation with both spiritual and numerical growth in the days ahead, as you continue on your mission in your world. We thank you that these men have been become elders, not just in Ravenhill, but in the Presbytery of East Belfast and the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. We give you thanks for the privilege it is to support and encourage one another across this part of the city. And so we pray your blessing on the network of partners in the gospel that makes up this presbytery. And Father, we long and pray for a reviving of our denomination in these days right across this island, north and south, east and west. Lord, let us be like that burning bush, set us on fire for you, for your gospel and for your kingdom. Would you raise up shepherds for your sheep and laborers for your harvest fields? We pray for those who are currently studying for the ministry. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to partner with you in your mission in training and equipping your people. So help us be generous in our support of them and through the Students' Bursary Fund. Father, help us to be generous as you are generous. And we thank you too for the privilege that it is to be part not just of a local church fellowship, a presbytery, or a denomination, but indeed of your wonderful worldwide church family in all its diversity. A family that stretches across earth and heaven through time and eternity. For there is indeed one body, one faith, one baptism, one church that Jesus loves and gives himself for. And so, Father, with thanksgiving for prayers answered in the past, we humbly present our prayers before you this evening for your church and for your world. Would you pour out your spirit, speak your word, and build your church, Lord, in this and every place until your glory is everywhere. For, Father, we pray all these things for your glory alone, in the power of the spirit, and in the name of our crucified, risen, ascended, reigning, and returning Lord Jesus Christ, who ever lives in unity with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Folks, we're going to continue responding to what God is doing amongst us this evening. As we worship Him in song, we're going to commit ourselves into His service, into His worship, for worshiping Him and to His glory as we stand together and unite our voices and our hearts in praise, worshiping Him, singing, Worthy is the Lamb.
pray together. Holy Father, thank you for this evening. Every aspect of the service, everything said and done in your name. As we go out into the night, will you go with us and into the rest of this week, whatever is before us. And so now may your grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, abide, and remain with us this night and then forevermore. Please be seated. Just before we have a cup of tea, just a number of people I'd like to thank tonight. First of all, can I just thank each and every one of you for being here tonight as a congregation. This morning we were thinking about Barnabas, the encourager, and just how even with his presence, he really encouraged others. So I know that your presence tonight has really encouraged each of our elders as they've been ordained tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you too to those of you who are up for this, you're up for being elders. Um, it has been a real joy to see the whole process take place here from the nominations to uh, the discussion in the eldership to, to the vote and to, to you guys being willing to serve. Um, I am really excited uh, to see how God uses you here in this place. Thank you for all the hard work you put into the training and uh, thank you in advance for what you're going to do here in the coming years. But I am thrilled and excited. And I finally thank you to the, the Commission. I thank you to each of you for the time that you've given, for the work that you've put in, for the things that you've shared with us, for the way you've encouraged us. Um, and every time that the time we had with you, we all came away being really encouraged, sensing that this really is a work of God. So thank you so much for, for all that you've done, and we really, really appreciate it. And there's just one thing I'd like to ask each of you to do, and that's simply to pray. Please pray for these elders who've been ordained tonight. Pray for them as they lead. Pray for our current elders as well as we gel and as we lead together. And pray for our congregation. Pray that in this community we would be a light for Jesus Christ, a church that would bring him glory in this place. So please, 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 we, we really genuinely covet your prayers. And um, well, it's now time for some tea and some coffee, so stick around and it'll be brought to you. And if you need to go, um, you need to go. But if you can't stick around, stick around and have a chat and enjoy some fellowship. But thank you all for being here tonight.